Uh, my name is Robert Deeds. I, was, uh, I lived in Grand Island, Nebraska when I was a, a child. I had four brothers and four sisters and my mother and dad. It was during the Depression, and things were pretty rough, really. Dad was a cement contractor. He did, he did cement work, sidewalks and driveways, and built basements out of blocks, and he did brickwork also. My mother was a pretty religious woman, very kind to his kids all the time. She worked hard every day, getting his meals and doing sewing for us. And we kept our clothes tore up pretty good, as boys did. It was generally a, a pretty good life, but a pretty rough life. I was uh, along in the middle of the boys. I had one older brother named Lloyd and one named Marianne. And then I came, I had three sisters and then another brother at the last. I had uh, the oldest child was a, a sister. She lived in Phoenix, Arizona until she passed. Now I have uh, two, brother, two sisters and one brother and myself are all of us that are living now. When I was 16 years old, I was working with my dad. I had quit school. He was hard to get along with, pretty mean, and I left home, just thought I'd make it on my own. I was pretty scared at times because you never knew and, and uh, what would happen when you'd meet people. I rode freight trains sometimes, and you'd, you'd meet a lot of people on trains. There were a lot of people riding trains in, in the box cars and in the coal cars. Then I hitchhiked a lot, too. I, I did better hitchhiking. I, I liked to hitchhike better than I did to ride the trains. And at times, you never knew where you was going to be able to stay. If if it was raining when night come, you just you just got under a tree or, or in a in a culvert under the road and slept wherever you could the best you could. But eventually, I I got a job pulling an old whole combine in a wheat field in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas. It came a huge rain and flooded the the grain elevator, and they couldn't uh, the the grain that was in the augers all swelled up, and they couldn't work anymore. So we got laid off. Well, that night I was going to leave town. I had probably about thirty-five or forty dollars in my pocket, and the, which was to me was an awful, almost like a fortune then. And I was standing outside of town with my little tin suitcase waiting on a ride, and the cops pulled up. And they said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to leave here. I'm going to try to get a job. And they said, well, there was a restaurant over across the street, a little cafe. And they said, well, come on, let's get a cup of coffee. And we went over there, and they bought me a cup of coffee. And he said, well, we're going to take you down to the station. He said, that we're, not going to, we're going to put you in a cell by yourself or nobody can't bother you. We'll, we'll give you something to eat. And he said, in the morning, we'll give you breakfast, and you're free to go if you want to. And he said, uh, from now on, he said, if you get in a town and you and you uh, don't have any place to stay, he said, you go to the police station. You can, they can, they'll give you a place to stay. Well, hell, that was great for me. Hell, I look, I went all over the United States, and, and uh, I've probably been, <laughs> probably been in more jailhouses than most most criminals ever have been. When uh, I had been working in Texas, and I came back to, to Arkansas, and I was working in Fort Smith, carrying singles for a couple of roofers up there. I'd been working with them, oh, about a month, I guess. My birth, my 18th birthday rolled around, and, and I was thinking pretty strong then, and, and before the month was out, I quit quit my job with them and joined the Marine Corps. I, I took my physical in Little Rock. A couple of days later, they sent uh, uh, quite a few of us to San Diego, where I took my basic training. Sergeant Chatham, Staff Sergeant Chatham, was our senior DI. I don't remember the junior DIs, but he made he made quite an impression on me. He was a huge guy, and what he said was absolute law. It was absolute law. If you didn't think so, you would know so before very long. He got a hold of you. That was. He would not let you know that he was the boss. Finally, we we graduated boot camp, and I, I was I was proud to be a Marine. 
because I thought then I was a Marine for sure, which I, I, I guess I was, but not near so much as I was later on. Uh, before very long, we went to Treasure Island in, in San Francisco Bay. We got shipped out to uh, Guam. We left on uh, General Hayes. It was a transport ship, and it took us 31 nights and 30 days to get there. We finally got ashore. It was hard to walk then. It seemed crazy, but it was hard to walk on the ground after walking on a ship that long. We were taken to Camp Weetak. We run fuel problems in the jungle there practically all the time. Almost every day we would we, we was going through really a, uh, infantry training. We were there about 16 months and Typhoon Allen hit and we all we didn't have any place to stay. They tore up the island. We were underground in underground ammunition areas when when the typhoon main part of the typhoon hit. When we went back to our area, machine gunners' quantity hut was turned upside down on top of ours. But needless to say, we worked there a little while, while straightening things up, and then we all got shipped back to Camp Pendleton. We were there probably, I don't know, a month or maybe six weeks, and the Korean War broke out. Things got hectic on the base then. There was a lot of preparations being made. I'll never forget, we we were loading machine gun belts by hand, and your fingers would get bl big blisters on them, on your forefinger and your thumb from trying to twist those cartridges into the webbing on that belt. Before too long, uh, we were all sent to Korea. We went over on the, on the USS Pickaway. There was three ships of us went over. It was the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade with, with a lot of armor. They took tanks and all, all necessary equipment to fight a war with, except planes. They didn't take any planes. When we got there, everybody was real nervous. Not many of us had been in combat. I sure hadn't, and most of us hadn't. A few of the older sergeants and, and some of the officers had been and during World War II. First, we went to Kobe, Japan. We stopped in Kobe, Japan, and uh, we put our sea bags in a warehouse there. We went to uh, Pusan from Kobe. and. When we got there, it, it was just mass confusion. There was ships from a lot of the UN countries in there unloading, and you could hear artillery in the in the background. It was, it was they were that close to Busan. Finally, we got aboard trucks and we went to the western side of the peninsula, but just probably 20 miles. We set up there. They told us to dig in, Bobby Joe and myself, Bobby Joe Wilder, I was a BA Armand then and he was my assistant BA Armand. We started digging in and the ground was real rocky and hard and hard clay and, and there wasn't anything happening with us but the artillery was firing over our heads. It sounded similar to a train when a shell would come over. And we were really getting pretty good, big kick out of it. Uh, Bobby Joe said, looky, looky. And way out in front of us, it looked like a house going across the flat piece of ground at a pretty fast rate. And then it stopped. I know it was a camo tank now. Before long, it started raining. And the artillery started coming in a lot closer to us. And, and we, made, we made quick work out of that hard clay. We each had a stand up foxhole in about 30 minutes. The first first combat we seen was the, the second day after that, I think. They told us we had a mission. And uh, this, was, this was pretty important to me because it was the first man I'd ever killed. We, we was going down this road in route column for about two miles. The Marines in front of us turned off to the left and started toward large red clay hill. 
there was a sniper in a tall building there was only I said tall it was two story building before long our our people had him pinned down they didn't know if they got him or not they called up a m26 Sherman this Korean somebody's hollered watch the road watch the road well I was right on the road where it turned I was off just barely off the road and I I had my BAR with bipods down the butt plate on my shoulder hens butt plate and this Korean was coming with his rifle swung across his back. He got up probably maybe 30 yards from us or something like that. Sergeant Perez started hollering, kill him, kill him. And he started trying to run toward the side of the road, trying to get his rifle off of his back. And I, I was right on him and I pulled the trigger. And, and I, was, I think I shot him probably 10 or 12 times. I was just nervous. and. I thought, damn, Bob, you just killed a guy. And when the tank blew the building apart, I walked over and looked at him and I really thought I was going to be sick. I wondered if he had a wife and kids. And, and I knew he had a mom and dad. But anyway, I was thinking about this, and we were walking all the time toward that red clay hill. The planes and artillery had been on it, and we got pretty close to it, and they raised your support and power, and Blackie Cahill said, I'm going to go to the left and throw a grenade, and when I do, you guys overrun that hill. And we did. That's what happened. And in five or ten minutes that it took to take the hill, there was uh, probably 40 or 50 dead on that hill, but most of, most of them had been killed by the planes and artillery. But there, there was mopping up to do. And we did that, and... That short period of time, I learned what a combat marine's life was going to be like. It, it was it was frightening, and and at the same time, you felt pretty sad about everything. Then we we got back with the company and battalion, and and the fight uh, kept taking place. We had planes and and artillery would would uh, sell these places, and then. And then we would overrun them. This, uh, this took place almost daily while I was in Korea. Almost daily we took hills. I've had people say, did you see any hand-to-hand -hand combat? I kind of shook it off. But every time you take a hill, it's close quarters. Any time you completely take a hill, it's, it's man against man at the very end of it. At, at, at that time, we, we, we were going to the... I think the name of, yes, it was the Nactong River. And that morning, they told us to to everybody, make sure you had two bandoliers of ammunition, that we had three objectives to take that day, and everybody just moaned because it was hard to take one range of hills in a day. And uh, we had three to take that day. It was hot, and everybody was sweaty, and, and uh, you just said, so tired you couldn't hardly go. But, but we did, we kept, and, and then when we took the third range of hills, then I knew why. Because you could look, there was, you could see the Nactong River, and there was, it looked to be thousands of North Koreans running to the river. We were all shooting at them. I don't know how many of them there were. Uh, probably a regiment. I have no idea. There, it was about 500 yards from our hill that we were on to the river, and everybody was shooting at them and driving them. And, and when they got in the river, the planes came in and took them. So the water is just like hydraulic fluid. It, it, it can't expand, and when they would rocket the river, it would just kill them with concussion from, from long ways. And I heard, uh, heard that the pilots said that the river was running red with blood when they got through there. That was one thing I'll never forget. Shortly after that, there was uh, what they called a turkey shoot. The planes had caught a, a motorcycle regiment. They had motorcycles with sidecars on them, but there was a lot of trucks in there, too. They caught them on a mountain road. We had to go by them. I'll never forget, as long as I live, the stench and the sight. I guess they knocked out the 
the front of them and the back of them, and they couldn't get off the road. It was just straight up on one side and straight down on the other, just a road cut out of the face of the mountain. And we called it the Six Mile Convoy. I don't know how long it was, but I've read since that there was over 100 vehicles in that convoy. When we went by them, they had been dead probably. It probably happened a day or two before we went, but it was in the hot, hot summer, and they were all swollen up, and uh, some of them had, had busted open, and, and their body fluids running out of them, and, and they all looked like black people. Uh, not all of them, but a great deal of them did, where the planes had got them with napalm. Everybody, everybody was just throwing up. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't get your breath without breath. You couldn't hold your breath, not and walk that far. As I've often said, when we got at the end of that damn convoy, everybody was so tickled, but I, I thought a group of campfire girls could have whipped every one of our butts. But uh, that was one of the one of the worst experiences I had in Korea was right there that day and all I was doing was walking. When we left there, best I can remember, though there were firefights after that, I know quite a few, but they, they, we went aboard ship and they took us around to the other side of the island and to the Incheon. Our, our uh, battalion, we were on the USS Dyashenko. It was an assault destroyer. It was, it was the nicest ship I've ever been on. They, they were really, really good guys on there. They took us below and, and showed us the torpedo tubes and how they loaded torpedoes and how they kept from getting water in the, in the ship, you know, when they, when they uh, loaded them and everything. It was really neat. The next morning, then, we had, uh, we had uh, breakfast, and they gave, we had steak, and I don't remember what all. Before daylight, we were all up on deck watching. It was a sight I'll never, ever forget. There were ships just just as far as you could see, and they were selling the mainland and, and the island of Wamido. The island of Wamido is where my company landed. But uh, Missouri was sitting out there, and it, it, was, it was pounding, I mean pounding the damn shoreline with all of its guns, and there was a rocket ship there. And when that damn thing would fire, it looked like a swarm of angry bees in the air. You could see the rockets going. It just looked like thousands of them is what it looked like. And when they would fire, the ship would list clear back. It looked like it was almost going to turn it over. And it would come back upright. I guess the gyroscope kept it from it, probably. We went ashore. Before long, we had taken Wamido the island of Wamido, and the, the rest of them hit on the beaches farther down from us. And they weren't really beaches, they were rock walls. They had to use ladders to get up on them. The next day, we took in Chan, which was nothing. There just wasn't any defense there. Uh, uh, one thing I remember, in Inchon, I saw a dead horse. It had been hit by, I mean, a huge piece of shrapnel or something, because it was cut from a front legs to its back legs in a semicircle and its guts was laying out on the road. You know, I just thought to myself, that would have been a hell of a piece of got hit by. But anyway, we started over overland then to uh, Sewell. We was on our way to Sewell. And the, the fighting got stiff then, for sure. And one day, I, I received a silver star for what happened in this next little instance I'm going to tell you. We'd come over a hill. I was a, a corporal at that time and a fire team leader. Our sergeant had got hit. I don't know if he was killed or just wounded. But anyway, he left, and my, my fire team leader became squad leader, Ronald Clark. And I really, really liked him. We'd been friends for a long time. When we came over this hill, we got pinned down. A lot of heavy, heavy fire on us. And we fell on the ground there. There was fire all around us, and and Ronald Clark pick, picked up his binoculars to look look at the, their positions down there. They were only like 75 or 80 yards from us, probably. And he got shot, probably a sniper, I guess, shot through the lens of a binocular and killed him instantly. Well, I just, that's probably the maddest I've ever been in my life. 
and I I just started crawling, crawling down toward him. I just wanted to, I wanted to kill whoever had killed him. Well, I got down, or by then, probably, by then, our Marines had them pinned down. And I got down pretty close. There was a a long tunnel, not a tunnel, a long trench dug with foxholes just right off the side of it where they could run from one foxhole to another. I seen one, the one cl closest to me was running down that hole, and I, he, he turned a little corner, and I threw a grenade in there. I couldn't, couldn't tell if I did anything with it or not. And then I got behind them, and I stood up, and I could walk down on top of the ground, and I could see the foxholes before I got to them. Some of them I could see bayonets moving in them, where the rifles was longer than the foxhole was deep. And I started having a field day. And it was easy. Everybody thinks, that, oh, God, you really did something there. But said, our Marines seen what was going on. And they kept, they kept covering fire right along in front of me. Foxholes were probably, oh, maybe eight or eight yards or so apart, 20 or 25 feet apart. Our Marines could see me walking up there, and they would just, the guy couldn't have raised his head up ahead of, our Marines would have killed him. There, there was, it was just just a cakewalk for me, walking down through there. There's two instances I remember about then that I want to mention. They were both something that stuck in my mind. Uh, this, this one, I could see his rifle, and it looked like he was turning kind of my way. His rifle, anyway, came to that side, and... And I, but I was behind him, probably 10 feet from the fo from his foxhole. I didn't want to raise up because I was afraid he might shoot too. And I pulled a pin on a grenade and let the spoon fall off, and I counted 1,000, 1, 1,000, and I chunked it in the hole. Well, he must have hit on it. It must have hit on him, and, and he was trying to pick it up or something, but it went off, and it, it blew him. Up, his back came right up even with top of the ground and then dropped him back in the hole. By then, my fire team, the rest of my fire team had got with me, and we just had a field day. Our Marines kept them all pinned down hell. It was just like going down on the street and shooting people. It was that easy. Uh, one other time, the, along the back side of the, of the row of foxholes, it was right on the on the crest of a real steep hill going down. And there was a road there. There had been a lot of traf of, uh, of uh, vehicle traffic in there, I guess, coming in to supply them and everything. But the dust was about probably ankle deep in that road. And that's where we were going right down. And this one North Korean jumped out of a hole and, and started running across there. Well, I shot him in the back, and it fell down, and I got up closer to him. I, I shot him in the head, and we kept on going. And when we, when it was all over, we got every damn one of them. When it was all over, and we we came back up to try to get over with where our platoon was, we walked by that guy that I'd shot in the head, and there was a thin stream of blood, maybe an inch or maybe two inches wide, run down across the road, and it didn't sink in that dust. And then on the far side of it, right close to the crest of that hill, there was a huge pool of blood there. And I'll never forget that. It just seemed like his blood was soaked into that dust, but it didn't. Anyway, in a few days, we had a lot of house-to-house -house fighting to do. There was a lot of, a lot of dead everywhere. There was a, a company, I guess about a company, had us sighted in and was just picking off Marines like crazy. They called a artillery strike on them, and, and they did, and then then we got on the move again. Eventually, we took we took Sewell. Shortly after that, we went back to Incheon, and around to the other side of the peninsula, we started north, see the coastline all the way. It was on our left going up, and we finally went ashore at Wonsan. 
we, we knew by then we was going to northern Korea. To, it was really getting cold then. We went up to through to the Taebaek Mountains. I think it was about 80 miles or 85 miles, something like that. But we finally got up there on a chosen reservoir. We didn't know it, but the Chinese had put 400,000 regular army troops across the Yalu River. The, the third battalion, the best I can best I can remember, we were set up in a basin about a mile long and about a half a mile wide. And there was probably, just guessing, there was probably five to 6,000 of us in there, in that one area. And there was, we had outposts out and everything. Well, Bobby Joe and myself had tried to melt snow and make coffee, to make coffee in a mortar tin and we, we couldn't get it done. And he had earliest watch and I went to sleep and he woke me up hollering, we're being attacked, we're being attacked. It was the heaviest firefight I've ever seen, ever, ever. Their, their tracers was green and ours were red and every fifth round in a machine gun belt is a tracer and it looked like a Christmas tree a mile long and a half mile wide as all lights turned on. They fired players and it was just unbelievable, unbelievable the amount of Chinese. As I wrote in the little story I wrote about it, it looked like one flock of blackbirds right after another coming down. And I wrote in there also that I didn't think you could fire a rifle without hitting someone I don't believe you could. Well, they overrun us, and it was it was hand-to-hand then. And pretty soon we started getting the best of them in our area, and they started back up the hill. But they had attacked us down. We followed them, and they were breaking trail for us, and we was just tearing their butts up. We killed a lot of them, from, I wrote in my story, from 10 feet to 30 or 40 yards, and that's the way it was. And at one time, I I went to reload my rifle, and I couldn't, my thumb was on my mitten was frozen so wide that I couldn't get it down far enough to load my rifle, and I pulled my mitten off and loaded it. And just a few minutes later, I had to reload again, and my thumb was so cold that I couldn't couldn't load my rifle, and that's when I found out, really realized that I dropped my mitten. I got Blackie Cahill to to load it for me. He was he was cussing the whole time he he loaded it. I know he thought he was going to get killed loading my rifle. Before too much longer, we got called back. They thought we was, they was afraid we'd get cut off. When we got called back, we bunched our men up to count our losses. And when we went in in there, I had 16 men and myself made 17 and got our losses counted up. Uh, I had lost 13 men out of 17. There was four left. That was that was some of the worst worst fighting I'd ever seen. Our, we had we had air superiority. If we hadn't have, we'd never made it. And we had had a lot of artillery. They had planes in there every day, just one one group of planes right after another. We finally we finally made a breakout and we got out. When we got to the the coast, that was 78 miles of of almost constant fighting. When we got to the coast, in company formation. To go aboard the ship, I counted the men in our company, and we had 29 in our company after having replacements twice. After that, we we went back down south. I talked to Charlie Mize on the way back aboard the same ship, and uh, God, I really liked that guy. Then I got stationed at Shoemaker, Arkansas, at Naval Ammunition Depot. After I come back from Korea, and it was it was a great station. Uh, I say great, it was great for me. And somebody said, did you see the bulletin board? And I said, no. And I said, you ain't going to like it. And I went down and looked at it, and uh, I'd been ordered to uh, stay in for another full year. They sent me to Paris Island. I became a drill instructor. After that, my my time came up for discharge, and I got out. I thought lots and lots and lots about my existence over there. And, and throughout all my life, and after that, I, I went to Benton Harbor, Michigan, and I got a job there in a plastic factory running a press. I didn't really like it, and there was a pipeline outfit in town called Van Ness 
pipeline construction. They were putting a, putting lines right down through the middle of town there, 10 inch gas lines, and I got a job with them, and that's where, where I made my living the rest of my life was working pipeline construction. When I first got out, I went to, to barber college through the GI Bill, and I was a barber for a little while, but I didn't like that either. Then I got a job as, uh, uh, as pipeline, on pipeline. And I worked there for oh, uh, a year or so, and I, I got to be a, an equipment operator, which paid more money. I worked, worked to pipeline for the next whole oh, 20 years or more. And then I retired early. I moved back to, uh, I, when I was working pipeline, I worked in all over Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and, and uh, Arizona. Anyway, after I got out and uh, quit, quit work and retired, I moved to where I'm living now. I had a, a little place that I leased here in Arkansas on the Washita River. The land, the timber company wouldn't sell the land. Well, the land changed three or four times. A big tree had fell through a trailer I had up there, and there was an old man lived down on the river. He was old then as I am now. He asked me what I was going to do then. I said, I don't know. He said, well, I've got that camp down there on the river. He said, would you like to buy it? And I said, yeah, if I can afford it. And he gave me a good price on it, and I bought it. But I still didn't own the land. And it was just an old shack, really. But I, I, I liked it because it gave me the freedom to... Uh, I net fished and, and hunted and trapped. And eventually, the land sold, and I got a chance to buy it from the new owner. So I did, and I tore the old shack down and built a small house there. And that's where I live today. I've got me a good woman. I raised uh, two boys and a girl from a, a previous marriage. Betty Jo is the woman I'm with right now, and we're as happy as we can be. That's, that's about all I, I got to say, I guess.